Coming up next week is the first midterm for 207X. Now this midterm will review the basics of how evolution works. It will review some of the differences between humans and non-human primates. What are the biological characteristics of us and the non-human primates? It will also review how we develop knowledge out of the fossil record. And finally, it will cover at least the first part of understanding the evolution of the Australopithecines. I'd like to take a few moments here to talk a little bit more about that and review some of the major issues to help guide you in your study for the midterm. Now, my own expertise in the fossil record is really on the origin and dispersal of the early members of our genus, the genus Homo, what we'll be getting to shortly after the midterm. And yet I have to admit that I find Australopithecines completely fascinating. In some ways, I think they're the most interesting topic within all of human evolution. And the reason is because Australopithecines are unlike anything that exists on the planet now, and arguably like anything that existed on the planet prior to their arrival. We sometimes use the concept of missing links when we're talking about human evolution or evolutionary relationships in general. And as a general term, this category of missing links is really kind of meaningless. It's sort of superficial. As was pointed out to me by someone at a conference once, the discovery of any single missing link creates the need for two more missing links as you fill in those holes. And yet, as relates to Australopithecines, missing links might be a category that has some value. And what I mean by this is if we look at the Miocene, the end of the Miocene, the demise of the planet of the apes, basically we begin with something that was ape-like. And we end at the end of the Pliocene, the period we're about to move into now, with the origins of something that was very much human-like in the beginning of our genus, the genus Homo. Australopithecines are the segment that fills in that gap. And Australopithecines are not fully like apes, and they're not yet fully like humans. There's something very different something that hasn't existed before, and something that hasn't existed since. And in that sense, they really truly, conceptually at least, are a missing link. Now this makes them very interesting, but it also makes them challenging to study. One of the things that we try and do in the fossil record is again find the appropriate comparisons so that we can test hypotheses about variation. One of the challenges of finding the appropriate comparisons for Australopithecines is we don't have many apes today, we only have one species of humans, and Australopithecines, again, are unlike these in an interesting and unique kind of way. So trying to find the appropriate comparative categories to test hypotheses about variation in the Australopithecine record is a challenging, but a fun challenging problem for paleoanthropologists to deal with. So when we think about the Australopithecines, we've covered most of the Australopithecine record already. However, coming up next week, actually, we'll have one final story about the Australopithecines, which are these fossils here to my left, the robust Australopithecines. Now, they're an interesting story in their own right, but they're a story that's parallel to our story, the story of human evolution. And there are a couple major questions, however, to think about when we think about the Australopithecines. When we talk about the early Australopithecines, things like Lucy and those fossils that we've already talked about assigned to Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus animensis, one of the major questions focuses on issues of locomotion. How did they walk? Why did bipedality emerge? How did their bipod bipedality differ from the bipedality that we see in humans today? How much of their bipedality reflected still a retention of adaptations, or at least morphology, that allowed for access to arboreal resources? These are some of the major questions that we try to address with the fossil record. So, for example, those footsteps at Le Tolly tell us about the gait of Australopithecines and give us a very direct visual cue into the kinds of bipedality that we saw, saw amongst Australopithecines. Looking at fossils from a variety of different locations and trying to understand the environment in which they're in tells us maybe some of the evolutionary scenario as to why bipedality came to exist in Australopithecines and why it took the form that it did. Other questions to consider about the Australopithecines, aside from the basic issue of locomotion, is issues of development. We saw the amazing specimens from Dikika in Ethiopia, the small child. Development is important because, again, one of the factors that establishes human differences and human uniqueness is the fact that we have such an extended period of childhood development. Whether or not Australopithecines showed similar extended periods of childhood gives us important information about the kind of learning they did, the kind of ecology they might have had, the kind of behavioral patterns and behavioral complexity they may have possessed. So understanding and examining fossils like Dakika or the Tong child give us some indication as to patterns of development. So that's another important topic. How much did they differ in their pattern of development from us? And specifically, how long was their childhood? What kind of children did they give birth to? A final topic of interest is how did geographic variation relate to these categories of species that we think of with Australopithecines? We know that we have Australopithecines from perhaps Central Africa, but certainly East Africa and certainly Southern Africa, which are geographically quite divergent from each other. 
and we know that there's systematic variation between those different geographic regions. Does that geographic variation reflect the kind of differences that we see between species? Does it correspond with reproductive isolation between these different geographic groups? Or does it represent variation within a species, and simply the geographic differences between populations within a species? This is an important question and has to do with how we classify the Australopithecines, but it also has to do with how we think about evolution in the Australopithecines, and especially how much variation is accommodated within the Australopithecine record. So these are the major questions to consider as you review the lecture videos from the past several weeks, the readings, your notes, the discussion forums. First, how did Australopithecines move about their environment, and why did they develop the locomotor strategies they did? How did Australopithecines develop? What kind of developmental pattern did they have, and what does that tell us about their life history? And finally, how does the variation we see in the fossil record in Australopithecines relate to either the taxonomy we apply to them, what species they represent, or the overall macroevolutionary pattern of evolution that we ascribe to them? Are they geographically variant populations within a lineage, or are they multiple lineages? So consider these questions as you review, and good luck on the midterm.